So welcome everyone to our Open SIM webinar. My name is Jennifer Hicks. Uh, I am the Associate Director of our National Center for Simulation and Rehab Research, uh, which supports Open SIM. Uh, so I'll be serving as the moderator for today's webinar, and I'm pleased to welcome today's presenter. Uh, Rachel Jackson is joining me here at Stanford, uh, and she will be presenting on understanding how exoskeletons affect muscle tendon mechanics during walking. So OpenSim is a freely available software application for visualizing musculoskeletal structures and simulating movements of humans and animals. Uh, the application includes a wide range of tools, for example, to conduct inverse dynamics analyses, uh, to estimate muscle and joint forces, to create simulations for motion capture, and then it has a suite of tools to analyze and visualize, visualize the results of these simulations. So the first goal of our webinar series is to showcase the cutting-edge research that's being performed with these tools in OpenSim. Uh, OpenSim is also a large and geographically diverse community of users. So the second goal of our webinar series is to provide a platform so that members of the OpenSim community, like all of you, uh, can communicate and establish new collaborations. Before we get started, I have a few quick reminders about the format of the webinar. Uh, we de definitely want to leave time for plenty of questions, uh, but we'll take all of those at the end of the presentation, and you'll enter those through the text-based Q&A panel uh, in, the web, in the WebEx interface. Uh, if you need any additional technical help, you can also consult the guide on our website. Uh, so with that, uh, now I'd like to go ahead and introduce our speaker. Uh, so Rachel Jackson received her PhD in mechanical engineering from Carnegie Mellon University in May uh, 2017, so pretty recently. Uh, her research focuses on understanding how humans respond to different robotic ankle exoskeleton interactions and also on using these findings to guide the development of more effective locomotion assistance and rehabilitation strategies. So this past month, we also welcomed Rachel to the Neuromuscular Biomechanics Lab here at Stanford, where she's starting as a Distinguished Postdoctoral Fellow in the lab. Uh, so we're really excited to hear more about your work, Rachel, and with that, I'll let you take it away. Thank you, Jen, for the introduction, and thank you all for tuning in for the webinar. Today, I will be discussing work I performed during my PhD at Carnegie Mellon University where I was advised by Professor Steve Collins, and the work was done in collaboration with Chris Gambia and Professor Scott Delp here at Stanford University. This work used OpenSim to perform EMG-driven simulations of a musculoskeletal model to help gain a better understanding of how ankle exoskeletons affect muscle tendon mechanics and muscle level energetics during walking. We previously hypothesized that providing passive exoskeleton torque support without injecting any network into the user would reduce whole body metabolic rate during walking. This hypothesis was based on ideas from prior work and musculoskeletal simulations of human walking that suggest that there is a large metabolic cost associated with producing force with muscle to support body weight. We thought that perhaps providing passive exoskeleton torque support would offload force in muscle for supporting body weight and reduce the associated metabolic cost. To test this idea, we performed an experiment. Eight able-bodied individuals walked on a treadmill at 1.25 meters per second while wearing an exoskeleton on one ankle. As they walked, we measured whole body metabolic rate, lower limb muscle activity, and lower limb joint mechanics. Each participant experienced four different exoskeleton conditions, each lasting eight minutes. Across these four conditions, we increased the amount of passive torque support we provided while keeping net work zero. This is similar to applying exoskeleton torque with a spring, as it can store and return energy, but it cannot inject any work into the user. So shown on the right here is um, a plot of the exoskeleton torque profiles across an average stride as we increased average torque across conditions. So what effect did increasing passive torque support have on whole body metabolic rate? In contrast with our hypothesis, 
increasing passive exoskeleton torque led to an increase in whole body metabolic rate. This was surprising to us as we thought we were offloading muscle force and yet we made walking harder. Why? We thought this may have been due to how torque from the exoskeleton affected muscle tendon mechanics at the assisted joint. So for those less familiar with ankle musculature, I just want to give a quick overview of the main muscles acting about the ankle joint in the sagittal plane. First, we have the soleus muscle, which is a uniarticular muscle. It acts in series with the Achilles tendon to plantar flex the ankle joint or push the toes down. Next is the gastric memeus, which is a biarticular muscle. It also acts in series with the Achilles tendon to plantar flex the ankle joint and flex the knee joint. Together, the gastric memeus and the soleus muscle are commonly referred to as the plantar flexor muscles. Acting antagonistically to the plantar flexor muscles is the tibialis anterior, or the TA, which causes the ankle to dorsiflex, or it pulls the, the toes upwards. Now, most of the work I'm going to be describing today is going to focus on the functioning of the soleus muscle tendon unit because of the similarity of the structure of this muscle to the exoskeleton we used in our experiment. However, I just want to highlight that these other muscles I described are important for generating efficient gait and are also likely impacted by exoskeleton applied forces. Now, muscles in general are complex mechanisms. Muscle force production is not just dependent on the activation of the muscle, it is also dependent on the force and length of the muscle. Muscles do not just consume energy to do work, they also consume energy to produce force at constant length. And muscles and tendons exhibit complex interactions during walking that researchers suggest are tuned for optimal efficiency. So given these complexities, of the human musculoskeletal system, we hypothesize that providing passive exoskeleton torque in parallel with the soleus muscle tendon unit may have led to unfavorable changes in soleus muscle tendon mechanics and muscle level energetics. So here's the idea. During normal walking, the soleus muscle behaves nearly isometrically, producing force at constant length. Therefore, as the ankle goes through its normal range of motion, the Achilles tendon lengthen significantly during early and mid stance, thereby storing energy passively, and shortens that push off, thereby returning the elastically stored energy. When we applied an exoskeleton in parallel with the soleus muscle tendon unit, we hypothesized that force from the exoskeleton offloaded force in the soleus muscle tendon unit, and therefore reduced muscle force, and as the ankle was moving through its range of motion, this led to less stretch in the Achilles tendon and potential lengthening of the muscle fibers themselves. Less stretch in the tendon, however, means less energy stored passively and therefore less elastic energy recoil. Perhaps to compensate for reduced positive work return from the tendon, the muscle may have had to do more positive work at push off, but doing positive work with muscle is costly. We could not, however, test these ideas in an experiment due to the challenges inherent in measuring, directly measuring muscle level mechanics and energetics during human walking. Therefore, we decided to use OpenSim to take on a musculoskeletal modeling approach to tackle these hypotheses. The goals for the, this project were threefold. First was to estimate how soleus muscle tendon mechanics changed as passive exoskeleton torque was increased. Next was to estimate how energy consumed by the soleus muscle and other muscles in the lower limbs changed with increasing passive exoskeleton torque. And third was to compare estimates of muscle level energetics to experimental measurements of whole body metabolic rate. So let's first talk about goal number one. In our experiment, we collected a number of biomechanical outcomes. So we wanted to use OpenSim to take in these measurements from our experiment and spit out estimates of muscle level mechanics. So therefore, we needed to figure out what appropriate pipeline or workflow we should use. Typically, the OpenSim workflow used to generate estimates of muscle level mechanics progresses as follows. And all of this information is available on OpenSim's website, but I just want to walk you through it quickly. So a generic model of the musculoskeletal system is fed into OpenSim's scale tool, 
to obtain a subject-specific model. This scaled model, in addition to raw marker data from motion capture, is fed into OpenSIM's inverse, inverse kinematics tool to obtain joint angles. These joint angles and ground reaction forces from ex the experiment are fed into a residual reaction algorithm that is designed to compensate for accumulated errors um, through the modeling process. And this generates um, an adjusted OpenSIM model and adjusted kinematics. These, in addition to the experimental ground reaction forces, are into computed muscle control, which generates predictions of muscle excitation. Now, I just want to highlight a little bit more about what computed muscle control actually does. Um, so CMC uses PD control and optimization to generate estimates of muscle excitations that drive the model to the desired kinematics in the presence of these external forces. This process, therefore, involves predicting muscle excitations, but it does not depend on any experimental data of muscle activations. So we did not end up using this typical OpenSIM workflow, and I want to take a moment to explain why. The main goal of our study was to generate estimates of muscle tendon mechanics. And to do so, we thought it was important to have the most accurate muscle excitations we could. And so rather than generating predictions of muscle excitations using CMC, we wanted to actually use measurements of muscle activity from our experiment to serve as the foundation for muscle excitations in the model. And although EMG is not perfect, we thought it might provide a more accurate estimate of muscle excitation. So instead of using the typical open sim workflow, we decided to conduct EMG-driven simulations while prescribing joint kinematics. These EMG simulations are driven simulations are not novel. Many other researchers have used such simulations to try to understand muscle tendon mechanics during a variety of different tasks. And the specific workflow I'm going to discuss today is very much based on work done by Ferris and Sawicki in which they were trying to understand um, soleus muscle tendon mechanics or plantar flexor muscle tendon mechanics during hopping with elastic ankle exoskeletons. So let's quickly just revisit what the original OpenSIM workflow looks like and how we adjusted this to meet our needs. So first, because we did not want to predict muscle excitations from computer muscle control, we did not use CMC. And because we are not using CMC, we also were able to get rid of the residual reduction algorithm. In place of predicted EMG from CMC, we um, actually process raw EMG from our experiment to obtain muscle excitation signals, which we use to drive our forward tool. And in addition, we took joint angles from inverse kinematics to prescribe kinematics in our model. And when we ran our forward tool, we were then able to generate estimates of muscle tendon mechanics. So now I'd just like to walk you through each of these steps of our now new pipeline um, to give you a little bit more detail of how everything went. So first, we needed to scale our generic model to obtain a model specific to each subject. Given that we were performing EMG German simulations, however, we had to ask the question, what generic model do we use? Um, so what we did was we adapted a model from Arnold et al. 2010, um, which was a model of the full lower limb musculoskeletal system. And this model is available for download on OpenSIM's website. Um, and the way we adapted it was first, for simplicity, we removed the head and the torso from the model. Then, because we were driving this model or simulation with EMG from the experiment, we removed all the muscles in the model except for those for which we had measured EMG in the experiment. So this left seven muscles per leg for a total of seven, I mean, 14 muscles. Um, and then we also changed the marker set that we used to correspond with the marker set that we used in our experiment. The muscle tendon parameters for our model were the same as reported in Arnold et al. 2013, um, which was a study done to understand how muscle tendon mechanics varied at walking and running at different speeds. So now that we had a scaled, scaled model to each uh, subject, we then took this model and 
with our raw motion capture marker data from our experiment, we fed these into our inverse kinematic school, and we generated joint angles. Now, these joint angles were important because we wanted to prescribe kinematic for simulations rather than letting the muscles fully drive the model to generate the motion. And we opted for prescribing kinematics to give us more confidence in our estimates of muscle tendon mechanics. Now, finally, to drive our simulations, we needed muscle excitations to input into our forward tool. And we obtained these muscle excitations by processing raw EMG data from our experiment. OpenSim, however, did not have a process EMG block, and so we needed to determine how to process our EMG data to obtain useful and representative estimates of muscle excitations. So first, we performed some signal conditioning. We used a relatively typical filtering scheme in which we first high-pass filtered the raw data to remove movement artifact. We then full-wave rectified the signal, which is equivalent to taking the absolute value, and then we low-pass filtered the signal to smooth it and extract important characteristics. We then normalized the filtered EMG to baseline, which we observed during normal walking. With this conditioned signal, we then decided that it was necessary to scale and delay the signal. Now, scaling captures the relative differences in peak muscle activity across muscles during specific tasks, such as walking. For example, during walking, the TA may only reach about 40% of its maximum voluntary contraction, but the soleus may reach close to 70% or 80% of its maximum voluntary contraction. Therefore, to capture these differences across muscles, we needed to determine different scales for each muscle in our model. In addition to scaling the EMG, we also needed to delay the EMG signal to capture the latency that exists between muscle excitation and muscle force production. Given the specific filtering frequency and order we chose to use for our EMG, however, we did not know what delay was ideal, if any. Therefore, to select scaling and delay parameters, we chose to perform an optimization. We performed a gradient descent optimization, which we scripted in MATLAB, though you could use another type of optimization technique. And I just want to take a moment to let you know that this whole optimization process was quite time intensive. And um, to potentially avoid having to optimize scaling factors in the future, if you plan on running simulations such as the one I'm describing, I would recommend collecting maximum voluntary contraction data during your experiment. If you have MVC, then you can normalize your EMG data to MVC. Um, and this naturally captures relative differences in peak muscle activity attained during different tasks. Um, however, because we did not measure MVC in our experiment, we had to go through the process of selecting scaling factors. So having processed our EMG so that we had some representative muscle excitations, we now could run our forward simulations tool. Um, However, in order for the forward tool to recognize the prescribed kinematics and muscle expectations, we needed to um, make a few changes to the uh, setup files. So first, we used um, a MATLAB function called prescribe motion in model, which was developed by Ferris and available at the link shown here. And what this does is it took the joint angles that we obtained from inverse kinematics and it prescribed those in the actual model which we were driving with our EMG. Then we informed the forward tool to use the muscle ex excitations we decided upon by adding an object um, called control set controller to our forward tool setup file. So driving the model with EMG while prescribing joint kinematics resulted in motions like the one shown here. And then given these motions with the associated muscle excitations, we could then run the forward tool to generate estimates of muscle tendon mechanics. However, to test that our optimization of scaling and delay factors for our EMG um, were, were reasonable, we decided we needed to compare, um, do some comparison or testing. And to do this, we compared moments and powers about the ankle joint that were generated by 
and muscles to inverse dynamics derived joint moments and powers. Now, the muscle generated joint moments and powers we could calculate by taking the muscle tendon mechanics that we'd obtained from our forward simulations and using uh, musculoskeletal parameters such as uh, lever arms. However, we needed to figure out how we could actually obtain inverse dynamics drive joint moments and powers. So I'm just going to take a small tangent to talk about how we ran inverse dynamics using OpenSim. So we used the inverse dynamics tool in OpenSim, which takes in external loads and outputs joint moments and powers. Now the inverse dynamics tool is naturally set up to take in ground reaction forces as um, most walking experiments collect ground reaction forces during the experiment. However, in our specific experiment, we also had external forces applied by the exoskeleton. So we needed to figure out how to incorporate these exoskeleton torques into our inverse dynamics computations. Um, so let me just first talk about how the ankle exoskeleton applies forces to the human body. So there's a force that's uh, applied into the shin via a calf situated below the knee. There's a force applied down into the ground via a plate embedded in the front of the shoe. And there's a force applied upward on the heel via, via a rope embedded in the rear of the shoe. And together, these forces generate a plantar flexion moment about the ankle joint. So how do we model these exoskeleton forces in our simulation? And what we decided to do was to model them as equal and opposite torques applied to the shank and to the foot. And the reason we decided to apply them as torques instead of forces is because torques can be applied to a whole body, whereas forces you would have to define the actual point of application. So how do we incorporate these uh, exoskeleton torques into the files that we um, then drive our, our inverse dynamics tool with. So we needed to add the exoskeleton torque profiles to our external loads. So shown here we have exoskeleton torque as a percent of stride. So we took these time trajectories of torque and we added them to the external loads file at the same place where we put our ground reaction force time trajectories. And then we needed to define in our model which bodies the exoskeleton torques were applied to. So for instance, um, we wanted to apply some, some torque to the shin, so we defined that exoskeleton torque as applied to the tibia. So once we ran the inverse dynamics tool, we could then compare muscle-generated ankle joint moments and powers to those derived from inverse dynamics. On the left, we have the results, the ankle joint moments on the top and ankle joint power on the bottom when we uh, generated these with our muscles, and then on the right we have ankle joint moments and powers from inverse dynamics. And what we see is that although there are some quantitative differences across these two techniques, um, which we would expect because both techniques are based on models, we see that these two methods um, generate similar trends in joint moments and powers across experimental conditions. And this gives us confidence in the chosen optimized parameters that we used in our, in our simulations. So now that we have some more confidence in the simulations that we ran, let's see what the forward tool output as estimates as to lay muscle tendon mechanics. Just as a quick refresher, I just want to remind you what our initial hypothesis was, which is that when we applied passive exoskeleton torque with our exoskeleton, we affected soleus muscle tendon mechanics and muscle level energetics. So shown here is a plot of soleus muscle fiber force as a percent of stride. And what we see is that as we increase passive torque support from the exoskeleton, we saw a reduction in the force of the soleus, especially during the middle part of scan. This reduced force in the soleus led to reduced stretch in the tendon. So shown here is tendon length as a percent of stride, and we see that tendon length decreased with increasing torque support. And as I stated before, reduced stretch in the tendon means reduced energy stored and consequently reduced energy returned. And so what effect did this have on soleus muscle work? 
The cellulitis muscle was estimated to have done more positive work as we increased exoskeleton passive torque. As you can see here, we have positive work of the cellulitis across conditions, and we see an increasing trend. Um, so even though we were offloading force in the muscle, we were actually making the muscle do more work. And this could have negative consequences for the amount of energy that the soleus muscle itself had to consume. So we wanted to understand what changes in uh, what these changes in soleus muscle tendon mechanics meant for the energy consumed by that muscle, and also what it meant for the energy consumed by other muscles in the lower limbs, because these could have been impacted by overall changes in coordination patterns. So this brings us to the second goal, which was to estimate individual muscle energy consumption of the soleus and other lower limb muscles. So if we just revisit our open sim workflow, we wanted to then use our estimates of muscle tendon mechanics to figure out muscle level energetics. To do so, we used the metabolic probe available in OpenSim. And this probe takes in muscle level mechanics and outputs estimates of muscle level energetics. The probe uses Umberger's model of individual muscle energy consumption, which states that muscle level metabolic rate is equal to the activation of the, of the sorry, is equal to activation maintenance heat rate of the muscle plus shortening lengthening heat rate of the muscle plus the mechanical work rate of the muscle. So the metabolic probe actually used this model with two modifications um, to actually calculate estimates of muscle level energetics. The details of the modifications are provided in a paper by UT in 2016. I'm not going to go into the details right now. Um, but when we ran the metabolic probe, we were able to obtain then estimates of muscle-specific energetics. So then with these estimates, we wanted to compare um, how changes in individual muscle energy consumption um, related to changes in whole body metabolic rate measured in our experiment. So let's first look at the soleus muscle as this is the muscle that we were expecting to be directly assisted by exoskeleton applied torque. We see that estimated soleus metabolic energy across increasing passive exoskeleton torque did not decrease. Um, even though, as I said before, this is the muscle that we expected to be quote unquote assisted by the exoskeleton. Um, and interestingly, if we look at trends in estimated soleus metabolic rate across conditions, they match quite well trends observed in whole body metabolic rate that we measured in the experiment. So these results suggest that those unfavorable changes in soleus muscle tendon mechanics that I spoke of previously at least partially explain why whole body metabolic rate did not decrease when we increased exoskeleton passive torque. So what about what happened to the energy consumed by other muscles in the lower limbs? So in addition to the exoskeleton side soleus, we found that the contralateral limb vastus, which is a knee extensor, um, also showed trends in metabolic rate that matched well those observed experimentally. And this result highlights the fact that assistance applied to one joint does not just affect that joint, but it affects whole body, metabolic, uh, whole body coordination strategies. Now, if we sum up the estimated energy consumed by the soleus, the contralateral limb fascist, and the other 12 muscles for which we had measured EMG, we see that the trend across um, exoskeleton conditions that we observed for this sum, again, match those that we observed experimentally um, in whole body metabolic rate. So now that we've kind of given these, performed these simulations and obtained these results, we wanted to feel that we had confidence in our simulations. And to do so, we conducted sensitivity analyses with those parameters that we felt we had the least amount of confidence in. We varied activation and deactivation time constants, maximum fiber contraction velocity, maximum isometric force, tendon slack length, and tendon strain at maximum isometric muscle force by the displayed ranges um, to see how they affected our outcomes of interest. 
So I'm just going to briefly show some results from when we varied Soleus maximum fiber contraction velocity. So shown here is what happened to average Soleus force when we had our original contraction velocity, increased contraction velocity, and reduced contraction velocity. And we see that trends when we changed this um, parameter in our model held across, um, which, which gives us more confidence in the simulations that we were performed. Additionally, if we look at instantaneous tendon length, again, trends held when we varied maximum contraction velocity. And similarly, average delay of power, um, again, trends at, across increasing torque conditions held when we increased and reduced maximum contraction velocity, although there were some small changes in actual magnitudes of these outcomes. We were not interested in just looking at uh, muscle tendon mechanics. We also wanted to look at muscle level energetics and how these were affected by changes in our muscle parameters. So what we did was we looked at um, the sum of the simulated muscles, though I could show also just individual muscle energy consumption of the soleus or the contralateral lumbastus. And we see that the change in metabolic rate or the trends in the change of metabolic rate when we had our original contraction velocity held when we increased that contraction velocity and when we reduced that contraction velocity. So similar results were also obtained when we varied all of the other parameters I showed in the table, and the results for all of the sensitivity analyses are available in the full manuscript describing this work. So from these simulations, we found that exoskeletons impact muscle level mechanics and energetics at the assisted joint, sometimes in undesirable and unexpected ways. Also, exoskeletons do not just affect the muscles and tendons acting about the joint they are assisting, but they can also impact whole body coordination strategies. EMG-driven simulations, like the one described, can be used for solving similar problems, such as assessing what happened to the mechanics and energetics of different muscles, or evaluating the effect of different assistance strategies on muscle tendon mechanics. We actually use the same pipeline to try to understand how work input from the same exoskeleton affected soleus muscle mechanics and energetics, the results of which are also included in the main manuscript describing this work. Such simulations are helpful and important for understanding how different assistance strategies affect gait. And with increased knowledge from these and other musculoskeletal simulations, we can begin to design assistance strategies with insight and predictions about how these strategies might alter or affect the musculoskeletal system. So with that, I'd like to thank my funding sources and my old advisor and my collaborators for helping perform this work, and thank you all for listening. And I'm now going to turn it over to Jen to conclude. Yeah, thank you, Rachel, for a great talk. That was really interesting and really clear. Uh, so now we'll go ahead and get started with the Q&A session. And so as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, we definitely want your questions, but we'll take those via the text-based Q&A panel. Uh, so go to the Q&A box um, in your WebEx controls, uh, which um, probably shows up on the bottom right of your screen. Uh, make sure you select to ask all panelists so we can all see your questions. Um, and with that, we'll go ahead and start the Q&A session. Let's see, we already, we already have questions coming in. Um, let's see, let me bring these up. So this is a question from Sang Jen Lee. Um, so a uh, question, I agree with the general ex approach explained here. That's some questions on the validity of specific steps. You explained about the EMG scaling factor optimization due to the lack of the NBC me uh, measurement. Um, oops. Oh, sorry, broke up. Um, do you have references demonstrating that muscle scaling optimization matches well with NBC scaling? Um, I guess how how much do you think the comparison that you did between um, the resultant torque and power is a sufficient validity of the method? Sure, that, that's a really good question, and I think this is something we kind of struggled with initially, um, just trying to figure out how to deal with the fact that we didn't have MBC. So there are, um, there is work out there that shows re on average kind of what your soleus muscle might be able to reach 
as a percentage of maximum voluntary contraction during during normal walking. So these references, um, it seems that our our results were in some line with with those um, references, but not fully. And the reason we kind of wanted to use optimization as opposed to just references was because differences in placement of EMG sensors and um, differences just across the tasks that we were asking them to do, um, we felt that by optimizing these parameters, uh, we might be able to get a better um, hit at what the actual scaling factors are. Um, and I think that regardless of what those scaling factors um, the actual values of them, I think the importance in the outcomes that we were showing you is that the trends held. So um, yes, I agree that the inverse dynamics approach is also based on a model, and so are muscle-generated mechanics or, or joint moments and powers. Um, but the fact that both of those models showed trends that were similar um, when we ran these simulations, I think gave us confidence that our, that our um, scaling factors were, were reasonable. Um, I'm not saying that there aren't ways to improve the method, but it, it was what we chose to do. Yeah, I guess the other thing to keep in mind is that MVC scaling isn't a perfect measure either because it can be difficult to elicit those maximum voluntary contractions from people as well. Um, okay, so great first question. Um, let's see. So a question from Chris Richberg. Uh, he said, high torque brought metabolic rate down again. Is it possible an even higher torque condition could continue to reduce the metabolic rate? Um, again, good question. I, I mean, I don't, we didn't run that condition, so I don't know the answer to that question. Um, a limiting factor would be just people being able to walk in a condition like that. One thing I notice when conducting these experiments is that the higher torque conditions just seem much more challenging for people to walk in. Um, and also, if you look at the differences in metabolic rate between that condition and the medium level of torque, um, there was not much difference and within, within the noise of the measurement, I would even say. So I wouldn't necessarily claim that that would drive, that that higher torque actually was driving metabolic rate down. I would say it was kind of stabilizing. Okay, so now a question from Jill Sarancoli. Uh, do you think that the inertia effect of the exoskeleton, that it's not really attached to the body, but have an impact on the result? Um, this could, we did try to include mass of the device in our simulation, so we applied, we added mass to the right leg um, at the specific, uh, um, to the specific bones in our model. However, um, incorporating some inertia could have some, some effect. However, um, most of the inertia is pretty well distributed, um, and the weight of the device is quite, is quite light. Um, but again, I, I would say that it could probably have some slight effects on, on our outcomes. Also, you know, there could be slipping and changing of the device on the person during the experiment, which could lead to some um, inconsistencies and, you know, uh, imperfections in the resulting outcomes. Mm -hmm. um, now a question from Ko Sasaki. Um, so thanks for the presentation. Uh, so First question, um, why were the body torques equal and opposite of applied to the model rather than um, ankle joint torques? First part of the question. So an ankle joint torque is just equal and opposite torques applied to two separate bodies. Mm -hmm. So those are the, the those are equivalent. Right. So it, it, it was just a choice that you made. You Correct. Have both ways. It Correct. should have given you the same results. Yes. Um, the second question is, um, so it, this study was with healthy individuals. Um, how do you think the results might change in pathological cases? Um, so I've done a little bit of work um, in trying to understand 
uh, gait in post-stroke individuals. Um, we have not done anything while assisting them with exoskeletons, but due to just the inherent differences between these two populations, it's really hard to make any statements on how I would expect these, this work application to affect um, the gait of, of those with pathological gait. I would imagine that there would be, it would be different. Um, I'm not quite sure how the, that it, it would be different, but I would not expect the same results to be obtained from able-bodied individuals and those with pathology. Okay. Um, now some more questions about the device uh, and how you model it. So first a question from Kim Kabanek. Um, where can I find more information about the ankle exoskeleton that you use? Has it been has the device been used in prior research or was it developed specifically for the study? So um, the ankle exoskeleton was developed in my former lab at Carnegie Mellon University with Professor Steve Collins. So there is um, uh, and I believe it's an, uh, um, a conference proceeding on the actual specifications of the exoskeleton we use. And this exoskeleton, or very similar exoskeletons to this that apply forces to the body in the same way, um, have been used in all of the experiments that we conducted in my prior lab. Um, so this would be work done by Professor Steve Collins and other authors would be, again, the work that I presented here, I have the original experiment, um, was one paper using this exoskeleton, and then there was a recent science paper that was uh, co uh, lead authored by Zhuang Zhuang Zhang, and that also involved use of this exoskeleton, and more exoskeleton-related experiments are in the process of being published, so more work with these will be coming out soon. Okay, so another question about how you've modeled the device. So this is from Jessica Bassis. Um, so did you, I why did you, so you, you didn't actually model the exoskeleton in open stem, you just applied the resulting um, torques and the mass. And the mass. Um, why did you do that versus modeling, building a model of the actual exoskeleton in open stem? Yeah, that's a good question, um, and I guess this kind of relates back to an earlier question talking about incorporating kind of the inertia of the device into the simulations. That may have been able to um, give us slightly more accurate results. However, um, I think we chose to do the use the method we did because it was a little bit simpler, and also what we were looking for were trends in our results. So it didn't quite matter, as long as that was held consistent across the different conditions we were running, um, then the trend should still still be expressed um, correctly. So I think it didn't, for us, it wasn't quite as important to model the exact um, way the exoskeleton was acting, so long as um, that was held consistent across the conditions we were running the simulation for. Mm -hmm. um, so now another device modeling, device and modeling type question from Mar Margaret Meyer, I believe. Uh, so very nice presentation. She says, did you think about the possible influence the alignment of the exo axis may have had on your results? So this is kind of a problem that's just inherent in any sort of um, experiments where we have exoskeletons acting um, in parallel with our bodies. Um, aligning these devices to act perfectly um, in line with our biological joints is hard, and so we kind of do the best that we can. But of course, we're, they're imperfect, and so they're likely, you know, the the moment that the exoskeleton is flying is likely not an ideal moment. It's probably applying forces also to the body in other ways. Um, but again, this is kind of just inherent in adding these devices to, to the human body and having people walk with them. Um, removing an actual articulated joint, such as been done by other researchers like Connor Walsh, where he has a soft exosuit, or um, Hugh Hare and Luke Mooney did an, did, um, an exoskeleton without an explicit joint, um, may apply torque slightly differently to the body. Um, but again, there are always some trade-offs around that, because then you can't measure your ankle kinematics. 
Now a question from Philippe Malcolm. As one of the promises of muscle skeletal simulation was that you would run simulations before or without doing actual experiments. Uh, so for your simulation, you use EMG and joint angles you collected from experiments as input uh, and then obtain results that match the experimental trends pretty well. Uh, could you uh, elaborate on how well you expect some simulations would work without EMG and joint angle input from experimental data? Um, do you think this is something that will become sufficiently reliable in the future? A uh, great question. Um, so I guess I guess maybe just to emphasize a little bit again why I chose to use the specific approach we did was because um, the thing that we were most interested in was muscle tendon mechanics and muscle level energetics. And so we wanted to have up to the point of estimating those the most accurate estimates of everything else. Um, and um, so we thought that estimating muscle excitations and estimating joint kinematics would add a little bit more uncertainty to our models. That being said, I do think that these, the current musculoskeletal models and simulations are getting better and getting closer to be able to achieve um, realistic and accurate, close to accurate resulting muscle excitations and muscle tendon mechanics. It would be interesting to run CMC and to see how the results from that are compared to the results that we obtained by driving our um, simulations. Um, also, CMC has some some characteristics where you can kind of constrain your activations to be more realistic, which I think will help, you know, give um, robustness to these to these more predictive simulation strategies. Um, and I think that just through experiments like the one I ran and more experiments being done in the biomechanics community, we can keep making our predictive simulations better. And I do think that they are moving in a direction where that's where we want to be. We want to be predicting um, what's going to happen, not driving them with measured experimental data. Right. Yeah, and I think there are incremental steps you can take, too, if you can reduce the search space for um, the torque profile of a device you're building or where you're catching it based on simulations so that, you know, you can iterate back and forth with simulations and experiments to save you time overall as well. Um, it's just a related question to some of the things you were talking about. Um, this is a question from Nidhi Sitakasi. Um, did you try running CNC with your data? And if so, how well um, did the ENG compare to activation was predicted from CNC? So initially, I did start out by trying to use some CNC, although um, we didn't spend much time trying to optimize it for our specific purpose. Um, original. Uh, outcomes had similar-ish trends in muscle activation compared to our EMG, but the timing seemed quite different. And so that was concerning to us in terms of trying to get out the actual estimates of muscle tendon mechanics. Um, and again, kind of what I was speaking about, if we had maybe spent more time trying to constrain those activations um, or what the CMC was able to discover, uh, then we may have been able to get a better match. Um, but again, we kind of just did a quick one-off test and then decided to take a different approach. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, now a question that I think has come up from two attendees. As you mentioned, having removed some unused muscles in the model before doing the EMG-driven simulation, what do you think the effect of this, what, what would be the effect um, on the simulation results if you had not removed them, do you think? Um, what, are, and what are some of the limitations of that methodology? So if we had not removed them, then we needed, we would have needed to have predicted um, excitations for those muscles, given the fact that all of this was being driven by um, muscle activity. So um, I guess the thing is that it's kind of impossible to measure all of the muscle activity in all of the lower limb muscles just because of where they're embedded and just accessing them during during human walking. And so um, I don't think it would be possible to do an EMG driven simulation. Um, you know, other, otherwise we'd have to we'd basically have to be running CMC to generate activation estimates and then using those for the mu muscles which we did not have EMG for. So it kind of has the same limitations to what EMG uh, CMC does in general. Mm -hmm. um, 
now a more general open sim question from Peter Vandenberg. Um, is the constructed model solely designed for walking, or would it also be applicable to other forms of locomotion? So you, which, mo you, which model did you use? Oh, I used um, Arnold 2010, which is, um, it was, it's a lower limb musculoskeletal model. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that model was kind of tuned a little bit to be good for walking and running simulations. Um, it has been used for other purposes, but the important thing to do when applying a model that's been built for walking and running to other purposes is to look at things like how, you know, whether the range of motion in this new um, movement you're studying matches the range of motion for which the model was, was validated. And if not, you know, doing things like comparing the moment arms uh, for those new ranges of motion to any to experimental data. Um, so if you're, so it can be adapted to do, to new uses, but um, in many cases, additional testing and validation is needed to make sure the model is appropriate for those new movements. Uh, let's see. Um, so we have time for a couple more questions here. Um, so another question from Philippe Malcolm. Uh, he believes that Rich Nichols has started doing ultrasound measurements of muscle tendon behavior with an elastic exoskeleton. Are you familiar with that work? Um, I knew that he had, but I have not seen his mm -hmm. um, his uh, his uh, ultrasound results. Yeah. Okay. So, so it sounds so. like <laughs> a great opportunity yeah, to do additional validation of this work, but. Um, I guess not too much we can say yet. Um, and then uh, I'll go ahead and ask one more question unless any more come in. Um, could you please go into a little more detail regarding the optimization method you used? So what parameters exactly did you optimize, scaling factors, delay values, um, and how did you implement this in MATLAB? Uh, yeah, so um, the, yeah, so I optimized the scaling factor for the soleus, the gastrocnemius, uh, lateral gastrocnemius, medial gastrocnemius, and tibialis anterior. Um, and, and I found one delay for all, across all muscles. And so those were the five parameters that I optimized. And then I used line search in gradient descent. So essentially I, um, yeah, and then I, I wrote a script in MATLAB. You can actually go, um, Wikipedia has a pretty nice uh, like overview of specific types of ways of implementing these optimization schemes in MATLAB, but essentially I just ran a line search where I kept moving along, I found the gradient, I kept moving along the line in specific increments until I hit some, uh, some stoppage criteria. And once I stopped, I then um, found the new gradient and then moved along that line, and I continued this process until um, we reached some final ending criteria. And I can, um, yeah, provide some more detailed information about the specific uh, optimization scheme um, later also. Yeah, so a question from Varen Joshi. Um, so why did you use the Uchida modifications to the muscle metabolic cost model versus the Humberger, original Humberger model? So um, I used basically the the model that uh, they kind of that Uchida had proven has better better correlation with uh, frog muscle uh, experimental correlation correlation to frog muscle experiments, I believe. Yeah. So we made some um, kind of in conversation with Brian Umberger actually did some tuning of the parameters to get a better match between. Um, metabolic cost for CMC driven simulations and experimental values. So things like accounting for, trying to better account for orderly recruitment right. and um, how negative work was accounted for. And, and some of that discussion is in uh, Tom Uchida's paper, um, which we can follow up with if you um, don't have access to that one. Uh, let's see. Um, let's see, from Chapin, Chapin, the core, 
So then um, what was the difference between the experimental and simulated metabolic energies that you computed overall for the whole body? Uh, so it's not quite um, a direct comparison because we did not have, um, because of the number of muscles that we were missing in our model, we weren't looking for quantitative uh, comparisons. We were looking for qualitative comparisons. Um, and so we just looked at kind of percent changes in uh, the metabolic rates from all the muscles we had versus the whole body. So we were likely missing model, muscle consumption, like basal metabolic rate we didn't include, um, but we were most interested in just at the trends. When we summed all of the muscles from all of the energy consumed by the 14 muscles in our model, matched well the trends in our whole body metabolic rate. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll go ahead and take one more question before we wrap up the session. So this is from Chris Richberg. Um, why do you think your results are different from previous results um, reported by Collins and Siliki showing a 7.2% reduction in metabolic rate with a spring-based angle exoskeleton? Great question. Um, and so this is, I think, a pretty common surprising result from people, like that people see because, yes, Collins and Siliki shows this reduction with this passive exoskeleton, and then I'm here showing that we actually saw an increase. And I think it just comes down to the fact that people are very sensitive to the way in which exoskeleton torque is applied to the body. And in these two experiments, you know, one, I was applying the ex torque ex uh, unilaterally, so it was only applied to one joint, whereas in the Collins Wiki paper, it was bilateral. Um, I was kind of doing a pseudo passive exoskeleton where um, it, it wasn't quite it, it, the, the pattern of torque could vary differently from the way the pattern of torque could vary if I were just applying it with, with a spring, um, like a mechanical spring. And so these difference in the actual profiles of the torque that were applied to the human body likely could have just affected the human musculoskeletal system and the way people adapted. Um, so it's not too surprising that um, in one case we had an increase in energy consumption, in another case we had a reduction in energy consumption. Okay, thank you. So um, with that, we'll go ahead and wrap up the session. There may be, have been a couple questions we didn't get to, uh, but we can follow up afterwards uh, or feel free to send us any more questions that uh, come up as you think about the um, Rachel's presentation a little more or read her paper. Um, so really thank you everyone for all the great questions. Thank you again, Rachel, for a really great talk. Uh, I want to close up and acknowledge that OpenSIM and this webinar series are supported by several grants from the NIH, including an NIH grant that funds our National Center for Simulation and Rehab Research. Um, you can find more information about the center, upcoming events, and other resources for the OpenSIM community on our website. Uh, and we also ask that you please complete the survey that will appear at the conclusion of the webinar. This will help us improve the webinars and choose upcoming topics. Um, so thank you everyone for participating. Uh, we'll follow up with an email that has links to um, the information that we talked about, uh, as well as a recording of the webinar if you want to watch it again. Um, uh, and with that, thank you again, and we hope you'll continue to stay involved with OpenSIM.